It's my privilege, thank you again, Jordana, to um, introduce uh, to you all a dear friend of mine, Roy Thurley, and I'm going to spotlight him for us all. Just bear with me one second. Um, let me just find where he is. There we go. And uh, Roy has been the chairman of uh, Hatikva Films for almost as long as I've been involved in it. I've known him for many years. Prior to that, he was the uh, director of Christian Friends of Israel in the UK, and he's been involved in um, advocacy work, Holocaust Education Days, uh, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance Days every every year for as long as I can remember up in North Wales. And um, when he showed me his booklet on the Gaza presentation back in December, when we were back in the UK, I was like, this is a something that we need to give plenty of time to, because I think there's a lot of confusion around um, our understanding historically of, of Gaza, Aza, and everything that's been contained there. So I want to just uh, hand over to him to maximize his time for us, and then Ruth will have uh, a, a time for Q&A afterwards. If you do have questions, please type them into the chat as he goes through the presentation. We'll endeavor to answer as many of those as we can at the end of the time, as time allows. So Ruth and uh, Roy, if you want to open up and share your screen, we'd love to uh, have an overview of the, the history of Gaza. Okay, thank you very much. It's a great privilege to um, be with you here. And uh, I'm just, oh, look, it's working. <laughs> it's, it's such a relief. It's working. Remember, we all prayed before. <laughs> Quite. So uh, I, I, at least I, I know I can get the first slide up. Whether I can get any more up after that or not, I don't know. But... Uh, uh, yes, I, I, I wrote this uh, little presentation basically um, uh, shortly after the the, the, uh, the the whole Gaza thing came up because I thought there's an awful lot of people who do not know what um, the history is. But before we talk about um, the Gaza Strip, what I would like to do is to mention, and now my PowerPoint's not working... Hang on a minute, I'm going to have to stop sharing and going in again because the PowerPoint's not working. These things are all sent to try us, aren't they? Okay, let's try this one. And let's see if I can now go down to the next. Yes, I can. Good. So before we talk about Gaza, what I want to do is give a brief word about Palestine itself. And the reason I want to do that is because the word Palestine does not occur in the scriptures at all, despite some publishers putting the names on maps of the area. And using the term Palestine is actually totally misleading, as Palestine did not exist during the lifetime of Jesus or indeed at any other time recorded in the scriptures. The name first appears on the scene after the Jewish revolt led by Shimon bar from 132 to 135 AD. Now, the Jews lost that battle and most were expelled from the land. And the Roman Emperor, Emperor Hadrian renamed the province of Judea as Syria Palestina, a deliberate reminder to the Jews of their traditional enemies, the Philistines. Today's Palestinians have no ethnic link to the ancient Philistines. The name derives from that given by the Romans. Now, what you've got on the screen at the moment is a map of the area during the Ottoman period. Rather than go back in history over 2,000 years, I'm starting a bit later. So during the Ottoman period, you will see that this area was not governed as Palestine, or even as Syria Palestine, but was actually split between the Balayet of Beirut in the northern coastal region, the Mutasarifliq of Jerusalem in the southern coastal region, which includes the city of Gaza, and the Vilayet of Damascus to the east of the Jordan River. The important thing to note was that the inhabitants of the area at the time, whether Jews, Arabs, anyone else, did not have any form of self-government, but were ruled from Constantinople, which is today's Istanbul. So 
up to 1917, there had been no Arab state anywhere in the Syria-Palestine region. Before World War I came to an end, Britain had conquered the whole of Palestine, as well as Syria and Mesopotamia, which is now Iraq. After the end of the Great War, a peace conference was announced to decide what to do with the territories that formerly belonged to the defeated nations of Germany and Turkey. And this included the area known as Palestine, which was of interest to both Jews and Muslims. Both sides were able to present their plans at the peace conference, which was held in Paris in 1919. And this map shows the division of the land proposed by the Jews. Note that Gaza is named as a city in the area claimed by the Jewish people. Eventually, the Paris Peace Conference had no time to consider the disposition of the former Ottoman Empire. All the time had been taken up with the rearrangement of Europe. So the conference was adjourned until 1920, when it met at the Villa Devachan in San Remo, Italy. The San Remo Conference was an international meeting of the post-World War I Allied Supreme Council and went from the 19th to the 26th of April. It was attended by the four principal allied powers of World War I, with the USA also present with observer status. This conference got to work on deciding the future of the Middle East following the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. The parties recognised that most of the territories of the former Ottoman Empire were not in such a well-developed condition as to be awarded statehood immediately. So instead, a mandate system was introduced whereby one of the principal allied powers was granted a mandate to administer a territory with a view to it becoming an independent country when suitably developed. Britain received the mandates for Mesopotamia, now Iraq, and Palestine. The mandate for Palestine was different from the others, as this was to become a homeland for the Jewish people, and the vast majority of them were not yet living in the land. This mandate, therefore, set out how the land was to be settled by Jews in preparation for when they could form a viable nation there. So, for the first time in history, Palestine became a legal entity. Before this, it had just been a geographical area. All prior agreements before the San Remo Conference were terminated. The Balfour Declaration was recognised and incorporated into international law. Sovereignty over Palestine was vested in the Jewish people. And the San Remo Agreement was included in the Treaty of Sevres, which was confirmed by the Council of the League of Nations on the 24th of July, 1922. All 51 nations of the League of Nations voted in favour of this agreement. The exact boundaries of the land covered by the mandate for Palestine were not defined at San Remo, but eventually the borders looked like this. Western Palestine was to be developed as a Jewish state, and Eastern Palestine, later called Transjordan, as an Arab state. Initially, both were administered by Britain under their mandate. In 1946, Eastern Palestine was granted its independence as the Emirate of Transjordan. In 1947, Britain decided to terminate her stewardship of the mandate and notified the United Nations 
as successor to the League of Nations accordingly. The UN proposed a partition plan for what remained of Palestine after Transjordan was granted its independence, recommending the setting up of an Arab state, shown here in brown, and a Jewish state, shown here white, and an international zone to include Jerusalem, which you can see in the center. For the first time, what we know as the Gaza Strip was shown, being connected to Egypt in the southwest and what is usually called the West Bank by a narrow crossing in its north. This resolution, number 181, was only a recommendation to consider partition. The recommendation was accepted by the Jewish leadership, but rejected by the Arabs. The recommendation had no legal validity once rejected. Dead in the water. When the State of Israel was declared at the end of the British Mandate period, 14th May 1948, it became the fulfilment of the Mandate for Palestine, which had been created in order to bring about this outcome in due course. Israel therefore legally inherited the entire area of Western Palestine. Although the manner by which the fulfillment came about left much to be desired, the Jewish state of Israel was what was envisaged by the writers of the San Remo Agreement nearly 30 years earlier. Immediately after Israel's declaration of independence, the fledgling state was attacked by Egypt in the south, Transjordan in the east, and Syria in the north, with forces from Iraq also joining in. This map shows what the area looked like at the end of the war. Transjordan had captured territory west of the Jordan, so renamed itself as the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Syria had taken the Golan Heights, that's right up the top right-hand corner of this map. We are going to concentrate on the Gaza Strip, which is shown on this map as being under Egyptian administration. Israeli forces first took the region in the 1948 Arab-Israeli War and then ceded the current Gaza Strip to Egypt as part of the 1949 armistice. That same year, Palestinian terrorist groups, or Fedayeen, with Egyptian military support, began systematic raids against Israeli civilians, killing over 400 between 1951 and 1956. Israel retook Gaza as part of its broader operation against Egypt in the 1956 Suez Crisis, before withdrawing and being replaced by Egyptian forces in early 1957. We then come to the Six Day War. This map shows the land under Israeli control at the end of the Six Day War of 1967. Israel took control of the Gaza Strip again during the war and began opening a portion of the area to Israeli settlement. Jewish settlement of that region actually began with Abraham and Isaac living in Gerar, which we read about in Genesis chapter 20. There was a Jewish presence there throughout the centuries until 1929, when they were forced to leave because of the Arab uprising. In 1946, Kibbutz Kafar Doron was founded. This was abandoned in 1948, but reformed in 1970 after the Six Day War, along with 20 other Jewish settlements. 
After the 1967 war, the territory under Israeli control was almost identical to that which comprised the mandate for Palestine. The 1978 Camp David Accords between Israel and Egypt did not include Gaza in the land transferred back to Egypt. Significant terrorist attacks on Israel from Gaza, including suicide bombings and abductions of IDF soldiers, resumed with the outbreak of the First Intifada and the founding of Hamas as the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood in 1987. Hamas is the acronym for Harakat al mukawama al-Islamiya, usually translated as the Islamic resistance movement. Interestingly, Hamas is also a word in Hebrew meaning violence, which seems to be quite appropriate. After six years of conflict, the IDF withdrew from the 80% of Gaza without Israeli settlements as part of the 1993 Oslo Agreement between Israel and the Palestinian Liberation Organization, or PLO. Attacks from Gaza on Israel, which now included rocket attacks, resumed during the second intifada between 2000 and 2005, immediately after which Israel dismantled the remaining settlements, including forcibly removing around 8,000 Israeli citizens and withdrew unilaterally from the entirety of Gaza. As can be seen on the screen, there have been many confrontations through the 30 years since the Oslo Agreement. This pattern of violence is inseparable from Hamas's categorical hostility to Israel's existence. The group's founding charter holds that no true Muslim, quote, can abandon Palestine or part of it, and that there is no escape for raising the banner of jihad to remove Israel from it. Hamas condones any tactics necessary to contribute to its ultimate goal, including both indiscriminate attacks on Israeli citizens and using Palestinian citizens as so-called martyrs in its self-proclaimed struggle. I want to say a few words about UNRWA. UNRWA is the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, established as a result of Israel's War of Independence. At that time, it was responsible for around 750,000 Arab refugees who had formerly been resident in Israel. Unlike the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the UNHCR, which deals with refugees in the rest of the world, UNRWA does not aim to resettle the refugees outside of Israel and includes in their numbers all descendants of those original refugees. Today, these number around 5 million. The former US Secretary of State recently said that the number of refugees from Israel's War of Independence still alive today is thought to be under 200,000, or 4% of those that are under UNRWA's care. So-called Palestinian refugees are located in 61 refugee camps, of which eight are in the Gaza Strip, which does beg the question as to why there are refugee camps for Palestinians in the Palestinian area. Now, your image of a refugee camp is probably rows of tents, as it is in most of the world. The largest camp in the Gaza Strip is Jabalia, which is shown here. It looks actually a little different from any other part of Gaza, very densely populated. This is an aerial view, and if you can see here, it is embedded totally within non-UNRWA territory. That's, in theory, the UNRWA is within that white line that is drawn around there. 
In practice, within that line, they provide services for the 116,000 refugees registered there, but they don't govern it. UNRWA provides aid to these refugees at a rate of 50% higher than that given to other refugees by the UNHCR, 50% more money per person, and without any prospect of their status changing. Meanwhile, the rest of the world is sticking to the mantra of the two-state solution. And this is actually wrong on two counts. First, as we have seen, there already are two states in Palestine. There's an Arab one called Jordan and a Jewish one called Israel. So dividing Israel by taking away its heartland of Judea and Samaria would create a second Arab state, or the third state in total. But there is also no love lost between the Arabs of the so-called West Bank and those who live in the Gaza Strip. For many years, they have been unable to form a joint government. So potentially, the Gaza Strip would also to be given, have to be given its own independence. So two-state is clearly wrong. Secondly, it would not provide a solution to the Arab-Israel dispute. As we have already said, the Palestinian leadership want to liberate Palestine from the river to the sea. They will only be satisfied with the total elimination of Israel, which is not going to happen. So the two-state solution is in fact a three-state or even four-state scenario, which our politicians and much of the church needs to know. Will peace come? Possibly. But it is worth remembering that the Palestinian Authority has been educating its people to hate Israelis for over 50 years. It will take a massive program of re-education to change the situation to one of real peace. But true peace will only come when the Prince of Peace comes. Are there any questions? So, Roy, that was absolutely amazing. Um, I wish that we could put you out there for a lot of other people to see, because living here in Israel, I am unfortunately very aware of how ignorant most of the global world is, not even just the Christian or the Gentile, but the Jewish community also. Most people do not know uh, the history of Gaza, the history of Israel, and uh, certainly not the history of the UN and how uh, what they've done basically to destroy any real prospect of the Arab people getting their own freedom and their own rights. Uh, the whole thing is, is a mess that obviously we're seeing now because of the war. So thank you. I, I think I speak on behalf of all 71 people out there. It was amazing, very educational. Uh, I'm curious, from my point of view, if you could tell us what got you so intrigued or involved with learning about Gaza? Um, knowing about Gaza, basically when I, I did, this research has been done since 7th of October. Okay, so when that happened, I mean, obviously, I, like everybody else who's a friend of Israel, was absolutely appalled to, to, to see the videos and to hear what's happening and everything like that. But um, a, a, a friend of mine along the coast here in, in North Wales was setting up a special event uh, for a, um, a Sunday in November, I think it was, and he had uh, some Jewish speakers come along to help there. And, and I was here and I was going to go over there to join him for it, not, not, as, not as a speaker. But I thought he's got about four or five different speakers. And I know full well, if one of those can't turn up, he's going to turn to me and say, Roy, would you like to share something? So I thought, well, I think I need to be prepared just in case. So I prepared this talk, actually a longer version of this talk, uh, I've abbreviated this down to about 20 minutes, 
it's about 14 in its full length. Um, so I thought well, I'll do, I'll, I'll have that ready on a, on a, a memory stick, <laughs> uh, just in case. Well, it never happened. Uh, all the speakers turned up and they were all excellent speakers. So I didn't get to, uh, to use it as a tool. So what I then did was, oh, well, I've done a lot of work on this. I'll turn it into a booklet. So I turned it into a simple little booklet and uh, gave one to uh, people that I knew. And particularly, uh, I gave one to each of the board of Hatikva when we met in December, which is why uh, Stephen and Melissa got a hold of the booklet. Um, that's where it comes from. That's great. So we're having a few people asking if uh, your presentation is available. So one, the recording of this show will be sent out to everybody. It, it, we're, we don't do it the next day. We usually do it on Sunday or Monday before uh, of yeah. the end of the week. But um, also, Roy, with your permission, may we send out uh, copies of the pamphlet to everybody who who's on our list? Um, yes, you can. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I can. Um, I can send it. I don't know whether I sent it to you, Stephen, as a as a Stephen uh, has yeah. Did I? I think I've got it as a PDF. I'll double check, but we can certainly make that available. And yeah, we'll put the um, the full one that's uh, recorded up on the YouTube channel as well for Hatikva. Um, so and provide access through that way so you can share it with others. So this whole, the whole meeting will go um, through the mailing list and the, the usual link, uh, Ruth will send that out at the weekend. And then I'll put just just Roy's section up uh, as a separate thing on, on the Hatikva Films YouTube channel as well. So that's hatikvafilms.com forward slash the at symbol um, Hatikva Films. So youtube.com at symbol Hatik for Films, and it will be up there hopefully by the uh, the end of the weekend. Great. So you mentioned Hatik for Films. That was one of my next questions. Roy, I know that you are the founder of the chairman. Can you just tell us briefly uh, uh, to our listeners, what are, what is Hatik for Films and what, how can the people access that? What, what do you do with it? Uh, okay. Um, Hatik for Films has been going for a lot of years, but it was, it, it, it was started by... Um, uh, a, a filmmaker called Hugh Kitson, who is, is, is still with us and still making films, but he's no longer part of the TICFA. Um, but it was, it's there to produce films concerning Israel for the Christian community. That's its, that's its aim. Uh, and in fact, that is why Hugh's no longer with us, because he felt that he wanted to be able to address the secular community as well. And that would have... Um, endangered our charitable status because it was outside of our, our, our what we could do. You see what I mean? So we split off. We're best of friends. I was chatting to Hugh just last week. Uh, so, you know, there, there's no problem there. Uh, but both of us are really trying to produce information for the different communities that we're looking at, conveying these truths, which um, briefly I've just mentioned on, on Gaza. But there's a lot more to it than that. We go right the way back to looking at the, you know, the foundation of Israel um, back in 1948. We go back to the biblical promises and, and lots of things. So there's quite a number of different videos that we've got. Stephen is our, uh, our worker in the States, and uh, he's, um, I haven't got a clue what his official job title is now, but um, he, he's the man who does everything. So it's Stephen that you need to talk to about Hatikva, and we as a UK board support him in what he does. Well, thank you. We'll get more information from Stephen. We'll send it out. But I have seen some of the Hatikva films, and they are such quality and so informative. Thank you from both biblical perspective and to modern day. So, Roy, thank you so much for taking the time to join us this evening, or in Israel, it's evening, but joining us today and sharing your knowledge on the Gaza and, and really upping upping everyone's knowledge. So thank you, and God bless. You should have have a, uh, you know, continue to do what you do and be blessed. So I turn it back over to the Briggs and everyone, shalom from Israel. God bless everybody. Thank you very much, Yudet. Thank you, Ruth. And thank you so much, Roy, for that presentation. And thank you to Jordana for her uh, very informative interview as well. I'm sure, like me, uh, you've learned a lot. And I would really like to encourage you when you do get the recording of this to share it with friends, because I think what Roy has shared is important. Uh, to make more widely known, as many of you have, have said in the comments. And also, I really encourage you to look in the chat. We put the link to 
the Moon at Israel. And I'd like to encourage you to go to their website and see what they're doing to support Israel's most vulnerable children and families at this really difficult time and juncture in Israel's history. It's an organization that we support as a family, and I'd really encourage you to learn more about them and to support them as well, and to um, also be praying for Israel. And if you have questions you'd like answered or topics you'd like covered on future webinars, uh, please be in touch with that. We'd love to, to hear from you.